Hello, everyone. It's great to have you here with us today. My name is Brian Bennett. I'm the Alumni Relations Officer here in Trinity Development and Alumni. And I'm delighted to have you here with us for this episode of our Inspiring Ideas at Trinity series. Today, we'll be hearing from Leinster and Irish rugby players, Joe McCarthy and Ryan Baird, who will be in conversation with Robert Brophy. Before I hand you over to our speakers, a few things to note. This webinar will last just under an hour. We will take audience questions after the talk. To submit your question, simply use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage as much audience interaction as possible. You're welcome to pop questions in throughout the webinar as you think of them. I'd also like to note that we are using Zoom-generated automatic subtitles for this webinar. If you'd like to turn these subtitles on or off, simply click the CC closed captions button at the bottom of your screen, then click show or hide subtitles. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on our Trinity Alumni YouTube channel. I'd like to introduce you now to our speakers. Joe McCarthy plays professional rugby for Leinster in Ireland. He is currently studying global business, the Trinity Business School. In his first year at Trinity, Joe played rugby for the Trinity Rugby Seniors team in the All-Ireland League. After several standout performances, he was called up to the Under-20s Ireland squad for the Six Nations and subsequently Leinster Rugby Academy. He is an advocate for the importance of diversity and inclusion in sport and hopes to use his global business degree to make a positive impact on the sports industry. Ryan Baird is a Trinity student athlete and Ireland senior international rugby player. He also plays for Leinster. He is currently studying for a BA in computer science and business at Trinity Business School. He hopes to use his degree to become the sort of leader who can set an example and lead others to reach their full potential. His view of corporate workplaces is deeply influenced by his experiences on sport teams, and he believes the culture and environment leaders create in work environments defines the team they are involved with. And lastly, our host, Robert Brophy, currently with Interpath Advisory, is a Trinity alumnus and former CFO of World Rugby. After a wonderful four years at Trinity, he trained at KPMG before moving to Diageo as a finance manager. He joined World Rugby in 1996 where he served as CFO for over 25 years. As CFO, he was instrumental in growing the Rugby World Cup into one of the largest sporting tournaments in the world and in leading the financial development of the game. He has been a hugely influential figure in the world of professional and amateur rugby, helping to expand the game internationally and increase its global footprint. He has also been very supportive of the growth of women's rugby and rugby sevens. So welcome to Joe and Ryan for joining us. And I'll hand you over now to Robert. Thank you. Many thanks, Brian. And uh, welcome to everybody joining this webinar, wherever you are. And uh, as Brian had said, a particularly warm welcome to our special guests, Joe McCarthy and Ryan Baird. Um, personally, I'm thrilled that this is a conversation and not tackling practice because uh, I definitely wouldn't want to embarrass the two guys. But uh, yeah, we have we'll lots of... tackle you, Robert. <laughs> Run me over, like. Yeah, exactly, Joe. Um, look, I think it's a great opportunity to, to to gather this group. We've got some very interesting topics to, to cover. I hope we can get through them all. We want to talk a bit about sport, maybe particularly rugby, but sport in general, but also the business of sport, uh, the, the role sustainability plays within sport. We're going to talk a little bit about diversity as well. And uh, not least, um, Joe and Ryan's uh, in participation and involvement in Trinity College, um, my alumni. And, uh, and finally, we'll have a bit of Q&A um, to finish at uh, at about uh, 12, uh, one forty-five or so our time. So just if I may, Joe, uh, speaking, bringing you in first, um, I have seen a photograph of Joe McCarthy in an under 14 Ds. That's the fourth team in Blackrock College way back. And uh, I'd, I'd know some of the characters involved in that team as well. But Joe, maybe talk us through that rapid rise from back then to, you know, man of the match against France and and, uh, and, a, and a wonderful World Cup as well. And just your your whole rugby and life experience since then, if, if that's okay. Yeah, um, thanks, Robert. Uh, no, thankfully, things got a bit better after that under 14 D. <laughs> uh, so now, but uh, well, actually, it's funny enough because I've um, a few of my mates who are on the under 13 C's, 
who I'm still good mates with now, and they slagged me for being the team of Bolton, but our team actually managed to win a trophy that year. It's and I remember H- H- Hugo Keenan, I think, was uh, also on a team sheet as sub for the under 14 Cs, but anyway, let's not dwell on that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I always loved rugby growing up. Obviously, going to Black Rock, it's a massive rugby school. It's almost like a bit of a religion there, uh, almost. And uh, I didn't, I've probably talked about this before, but I never really made like a first team. Um, all the way up through school, but I always loved it and always trained so, so much. I was always kind of going to try and make a first team. And then I like, eventually that's supposed to go a bit bigger. I was giving a lot, ate a lot of food and things like that. I, I eventually made um, the first team, the ST team in my last year in school. And then I probably didn't really see rugby as being the full career for me. Like I loved it, loved it, the training aspect, really wanted to kind of maximize my potential in it. But um, I wasn't sure. So then I, I picked Trinity because I was quite focused. I was quite focused on my studies in school and um, still thinking of what I was going to do. So I got into Trinity, started playing for Trinity, and that's kind of I was in the Lancer Sub Academy setup and things like that. But uh, managed to uh, get into Lancer Academy after playing a few games for Trinity and playing for the Ireland under twenties, and then um, kind of thought then being able to become a career. So uh, I've had a had a good journey, a lot of help from Trinity and Black Rock along the way. Great, and we'll talk a little bit about you know the uh, that journey and uh, and some of the some of the structures I suppose that are available to you. But Ryan, just turning to you, and uh, I know you went to high school initially and then uh, transferred to St Michael's, and you know I think it's fair to say you were a standout performer in school. But who and what were the key influences on you in uh, in in reaching the level that you've achieved today? Um, I can't look too much further than my parents. Um, you know, I have such fond memories of every Sunday going up to Old Wesley Rugby Club, um, where I would have played all my mini rugby, um, and then coming back home and you know tuning into whatever game was on TV. So, you know, it was such an integral part of my upbringing. Um, I played many other sports, but um, generally rugby was the weekend sport, and you know, um, it's kind of pinched me sometimes when I'm playing in the Six Nations that I remember, you know going to training on a Saturday morning, coming home, having a, you know, bacon and eggs and sitting down in front of a warm fire, getting ready to watch two Six Nations games. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I can't look too much further than my family and, and, and what they did to bring me to all these different venues, um, which was brilliant. And it really, uh, yeah. you know, made me um, kind of just enjoy the game. Um, cause it didn't take it too seriously. It was just having a bit of fun. I guess then when I, when I moved to Michaels, that's probably when I got a first um, taste of what it was like, um, kind of a more s- serious, um, I guess. Like Michaels, it was very professional, the the environment. Um, you know, I think that definitely helped in some respect with my transition into Leinster because, mm. you know, I was gymming two, three times a week. Um, we were doing, we were talking about recovery. We were talking about our nutrition. So when I came into Leinster, I felt... Uh, I felt there was a it was a, a nicer um, tr- transition. The environment in which I believe is is so crucial was uh, was was great in Michaels in in that respect and um, definitely helped me to excel um, as an individual in, amongst the team. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I, I just maybe uh, that's a good segue into perhaps the structures overall within within Irish rugby. Um, you know, we had the schools final recently, which was a, a sellout in the RDS. There was actually significant media coverage of the match in in the French newspaper Le Keep and also in the Sunday Times. You know, um, maybe staying with, with you, Ryan. Maybe talk us through how important those structures are from school to sub academy to academy to to Leinster Provincial and then on to 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 the Irish uh, environment, daily training environment. You know, um, has that been beneficial for you guys while you've you've gone through your career? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential because. When you're a young kid, you know, you want to be able to see a way of, of how, how could I do that? So, you know, well, I think what the IRFU has done brilliantly, uh, led by um, Dave News 4 over the last 10 years, is the that pathway. Um, there is, like, e- at each age, there is a progression um, to get to professional rugby. Um, so I have a I've huge, uh, a huge, like, I, I look back to some of the players who are coming up now and, like, yeah. you know, they to me years ago they were kids but they they were in such a good system they were under such good mentorship and, and coaching that 
um, they've risen to the ranks and we probably have held on to more sure. people than you, than you might have if you had a structure that wasn't as um, as efficient. Like. Yeah, yeah. And Joe, you've experienced that system as well. Um, you know, and you've also been, I suppose, fortunate to work with fantastic coaches in Stuart Lancaster, Andy Farrell, Paul O'Connell. You know, how important have those uh, those structures and those people been from from your perspective and uh, and the development of your game? Yeah, no, they've been um, they've been huge. Just uh, the as Ryan said, the system's so professional from when you're especially the school system. But then once you go out of that, it's um, uh, it's unreal. Like so. You, We've just played in Six Nations there, but me and Ryan would have both done the under twenty Six Nations, and um, that gives you like a real taste of, of what it's like, and it almost kind of sets you up well to prepare. But um, no, I've been lucky there. I think Ireland is kind of getting good at like developing their own coaches. You see Richie Murphy now, yeah, um, with the under twenties, and then this the systems that the RFU bring in, like they get the best coaches in. So I mentioned Stu Lancaster, um. All these coaches, Rob McBride from Wales, and um, we've obviously brought in um, Jacques Nimbar, Leo Cullen, obviously, to name a few. So, yeah, they uh, definitely get a wide, diverse um, set of coaches that um, is very good. And I think the central thing is that uh, all the underage systems and all the things, they make it very enjoyable. So, it kind of keeps your love for the game. Because I know sometimes yeah. um, you might lose a lot of players who, who just kind of yeah. fall out of the love for the game if it becomes like too professional or too too intense but I think they've done quite well in the underage structures they've made it quite enjoyable and I know a lot of lads um, who've even been out of the system now but they they love their time in it yeah yeah and just and just to touch on as well I didn't mention it but the club game and I know I think each of you I think I'm correct in saying have brothers playing in the club game um, yeah Paddy, Paddy for you yeah. and, and Zach for you Ryan you know, and that's a vital part, isn't it, of the rugby ecosystem within Ireland as well. I'm certainly a regular attendee down in Black Rock and old Wesley are, are, are going well this year, Ryan. I think, you know, you know, I think it's important for perhaps people listening to to see the value of the club game as well, that it's not just about the, the high performance end. No, not at all. Um, you know, we you look at some players who have come through the club, Dan Sheehan with a Sean when he played um, with Trinity, uh, Rob Russell, who is now um, a regular starter in Leinster, um, he came through probably Trinity. Trinity was where he played some of his best rugby. So I think it's, um, I think the schools are probably getting more attention um, over these last few years with the kind of the rise in the senior cup. But like, you know, yeah. back, um, back, my dad would have been telling me years ago, you know, you would have been getting sellouts for, for, for club games. So it's important that we um, understand that um, both, like they're the two avenues um, for Irish players to get into to professional sport. So yeah. um, appreciating both is, is so vital. And I, I have great memories playing with Trinity. Um, and my fondest memory tr- playing with Trinity was be- beating Cork Con um, at home. And, you know, playing in College Park is, uh, is, is a cool experience. Um, and I'll be yeah. down there supporting um, Trinity on Saturday when they, they play Colours. So um, yeah. it's, uh, for me, it was, it was very important. Great, great. Just to broaden the conversation, guys, a little bit and talk a little bit about the business of sport. Um, in, in my former role with World Rugby, um, I guess I was quite close to the, the finances of the Rugby World Cup tournament. And I guess you guys have been fortunate to play, I think, for the first time in, in the Rugby World Cup. Um, the, the, the revenues from that drive the promotion and development of the game on a, on a worldwide basis. So it is it is really important. And, there, you know, the revenues have... have risen exponentially over the years but um what was it like playing in your first rugby world cup you know in comparison maybe to playing for leinster and playing for ireland before that you know did you notice it to be a, a major global event that certainly the the supporters who attended from from all countries but particularly i think ireland and, and france were were were, were stand out i think um in in the in the world commentary in respect of the tournament you know but what was your overall experience of that Oh, um, yeah, it was awesome. I lo- I loved all of it. Like it was um, like different to anything I've experienced before. Like the whole build up to a big free season, um, with the Ireland team together. I mean, a few good warmups. We went away to France before to play some O and things like that. So, uh, and you definitely it felt different to like your Leinster game or even other Ireland games. It felt like there were so many eyes on it because obviously World Cup is kind of the pinnacle, um. Like as big as it gets so I remember like the media attention you felt a lot there was a lot more like media commitments um, and things like that because like when you're 
even I remember getting to the World Cup and playing the first game, which which was last against Romania. It was like yeah. 38 degrees. Um, yeah, in Bordeaux. Tough enough conditions in that. Yeah, uh, it's savage. But, uh, Very tough for the yeah. supporters, I think, Joe. I never mind the yeah, Actually, probably tough for the supporters, <laughs> yeah. I saw they're, um, they're all swarming around to the side of the stadium. Yes. Um, they were, yeah. They did a good few points to kill down and things like that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I think so. I heard they ran out of pints of water as well. Yeah, pints of yeah, so that, well, that wasn't great. But um, oh, I think it was. I think you saw the like the Irish fans were mental. It was almost like a different a bit of chat about it. Either being sometimes a bit too corporate or quiet. But I, um, I think you can definitely see that the World Cup is the Irish fans were were class or mental. But uh, no, it was um obviously didn't end or anything how we'd, we'd want to, but it was a hugely enjoyable experience. They like um, mm-hmm. you travel all the, all around France. Got to really embrace the culture of it. Um, yeah. and yeah. it was just the highest level you can play at, so it was, uh, it was a cool tournament. Yeah, yeah, and look, uh, I know it didn't end the way you wanted it to end, but I think it's fair to say that the French public were deeply disappointed when, when Ireland were knocked out as well as as well as the Irish public, and, uh, you know, what was really impressive, and that's something I wanted to, to bring up on this call, was, uh, if you like, the bounce back, and, and in, in the Six Nations, you know, I think it's a huge achievement to win the championship this year, but um, in particular, maybe maybe Ryan, you talk about you know the team spirit that was generated during the World Cup and and how 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 you seem to carry that forward despite the like the crushing disappointment of losing that quarterfinal and, and it was the bounce of a ball and the, the the twist of a body really between the two sides you know you know how important was that team morale to, to come forward into into Six Nations which you know happened very quickly after that. Yeah, and, and that's what you say, like, it's happened quickly, like, here I am sitting here, you know, hopefully playing for Leinster this week, and, you know, winning the Six Nations, is, it's just a memory now in my mind, so, um, you know, Andy Farrell talked a lot about, um, you know, because a lot of people will consider World Cups as cycles, so once the World Cup's over, it's a new cycle, but for us, it's, uh, you know, with a lot of players who were playing in that World Cup, the coaching staff was very much the same, um, it was just a continuation of what we'd um, been working on for the last three years. Um, and, you know, we didn't look at it as, we looked at it as obviously, you know, we wanted to win, but we, we didn't. But, you know, the resilience we probably, we gained from that because you have to suffer to to, to become resilient. And, you know, we have to reframe it, uh, reframe it as not a failure, but as, and look for the opportunity that, um, you know, we feel we have so much more to prove and to show as a team and to, and to learn. So, um, the best way to, to to show that is to get back on the horse and, and go in. So, yeah. um, you know, I think the way we, the way Andy kind of got the whole group to believe in that, okay, um, this is a continuation. Here's what we need to improve on. Let's go do it. Um, you know, we've learned from the World Cup, but that's gone now. We've forgotten about that. Yes. Um, we're, we're, we're forward focused. And um, I think we did that. We showed that really well. And, and unfortunately, we slipped up against England and, but on a micro level, we we show great um, resolve to come back the next week and, and win. So absolutely, yeah. uh, absolutely, and uh, I think it's that's to your credit. Just to go back to maybe the business end of things, I certainly know from um, the the co- conversations that are had with the uh, global sponsors these days that the, the role of sustainability plays a, a major part in their um, in their evaluation of whether or not they will sponsor an event and. Uh, Rugby World Cup, I know, with the with the French organising committee, we're striving to make that as uh, as sustainable as possible. It's always a challenge with a major sports event, no matter where it is, because of the the travel component for the athletes. But maybe Joe, I don't know if you noticed any examples of sustainability either at the World Cup or perhaps what you're seeing in in Leinster, Munster, or around Ireland in 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 in, in, the, in that context from a rugby point of view. Yeah, it's um, sustainability. It's huge at the moment. It's um, sort of the buzzword you hear everywhere, even in uh, my course, Global Business in Trinity, like you get loads of modules um, centered around sustainability and how like ESG and uh, things like that are becoming more important. But uh, yeah, no, you saw it in the World Cup. There was, uh, was definitely a big emphasis on it. Like I know even um, we had a train facility that was like built up for us. It was, it was actually class. It was in poor. They, they built a whole like, like state-of-the-art gym for us and pitch um, set up and that was all like solar panel um powered. So the roof of that was was all like solar panel panel yeah. solar panel powered. Very right. good. Yeah. Um yeah. um so you kind of really feel that. And we also uh we were lucky enough we got to bring our chef along with us um to to tour to to keep us well fed. 
Yeah. And um, but his his big thing himself, I suppose this is more of an RFU driven thing probably towards him, but he um he kind of labeled himself as the no way chef, or that's his Instagram name anyway. <laughs> um so uh he'd be he'd be very creative. Like say um we'd have like said pretty well now. Um but like say you'd have like some meat or red meats for the in the in the in the evening the next day or post train snack would be like a steak sandwich or something like that. So he'd he yeah. tried it and he's always very big on maximizing um all the food and reducing as much waste as possible. Um yeah. Yeah. so uh, I know Ryan yeah, I know. Ryan's very into his cooking and things like that, his good relationship <laughs> with him. So Okay. Yeah, okay. More that, yeah. but, uh, no, there's, there's you can see even like just small things like uh reusable uh, glasses in the stadiums and things like that. So obviously World Rugby were trying to make a big um yeah. big effort to be sustainable in a tournament like that. Yeah, and I think uh, it was a policy of the tournament that all of the training equipment would be uh, recycled and reused yeah. uh, around the world, which I think uh, hadn't happened at, at previous World Cups. So I think that's very encouraging. Just you touched on, you know, the professionalism aspect and, and, and the chef arrangements. But what about the whole role of sports science um, in, in your in your jobs, I suppose, you know, that the sports science bit and also um mental health training as well you know and and we touched on the disappointment from the world cup but also then the i suppose the the pickup afterwards you know how important is sports science i know it's probably two things sports science and mental health training but how important ryan how important are they from from your perspective and from the squad's perspective i i think it's um particularly if I'll, I'll i'll um discuss the, the mental part um you know mental health is, is important for everyone but um particularly with the high pressure um, um, environments that we go into playing in front of, you know, 50 to 80,000 people um, where you have to move from moment to moment so quickly. Um, it can cause a lot of stress um, it can cause a lot of stress during the week as well. You know, the preparation, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's so, so much can go through your head when, when, you know, you have such a, when you want something so badly. Um, and yeah. so it's very important to, to to break it down um for me it's you know i, I a lot of us um would speak to uh, sports psychologists or psychologists psychiatrists someone in any one of those fields because you know I, I think it's more normal in sports for people to just be open about going and yeah. speaking yeah. with psychologists and stuff and um, yeah. but it's something that i would uh, be telling anyone who uh is struggling in work or in life that it's, that it's worth going to speak to because it's, it's just someone for you to listen to you someone to to give advice and yeah. at the end of the day mental health is the number one most important thing you know and it probably yeah. leads into physical health um, yeah yeah where it's just like you know what who cares you know i made a mistake there let's yeah. give 100 percent to this next moment and let's give it our best because you know mistakes you can dwell on those but they'll, they'll only drag you down yeah um, and yeah, so and uh, maybe maybe passing that to you, Joe, as well, and maybe yeah. in particular the, the sports science uh, piece. You know, I I think uh, Mr. O'Connell's training sessions are pretty legendary in terms of his uh, his demands on you. You know, but you know, I, I guess you guys get a lot of stats, etc. You know, I, I, how do you balance all of that and then and then take it onto the field with you? Yeah, there's um sports has become so like technical now. Um... The sports has been, I know, Paul O'Connell, I remember, like, he'd be doing malls, and he'd be like, we're doing malls, like, how many malls are we doing? He's like, as many as we can do in 15 minutes, like, so, like crazy. <laughs> Some of that less technical stuff, like, but, uh, uh, no, it's, it's, I was true. I love the, I love the way it is, because, um, especially when you're in camp, because there's such a good environment, like, you're pretty much, like, absolutely optimized, like, we have a GPS on us now, and they track every meter, and, like, if you haven't done enough high-speed meters, they catch up with you on that. We've got like our gum shields now that register our um our impacts for concussion things like that. And uh, yeah, once you're in camp, like you have like they have our, the whole setup is there for us just to perform at our at our absolute best. Like get your body in the best and your mind in the best state of mind. So like there's like a, there's a great process in, in there. Like so you got our S and C staff who have tailored our program. You got your physios, your massage therapists, um. They're big on like obviously stuff just like getting a sauna, ice bath, recovery, um, recovery boots, all those aspects are sort of in there now. So um, yeah, you know, I yeah. find that's it's a pretty important bit because like, you gotta you gotta really train as much as you recover. So um, yeah, they've got us kind of like fine tuned, kind of you kind of feel like a Ferrari in there almost like they're kind of just tuning you up like 
It's great. And I think trying to, yeah. trying to get you in the best state of mind. So, yeah, exactly. Also, and I, you know, yeah. maybe it's it's important to say that you know, you guys are fortunate that you're able to receive that level of uh, of care and attention. I suppose you know, and and investment, frankly, in uh, in your in your development. And I think going back to our our, our conversation around the school system, you know, there's that I guess there's a fair bit of investment happening at the start there, and then bringing that forward through through the academies and through the provinces, etc. Yeah, you know. I, I was only talking to my physio this morning about it, how grateful I am for the access to such um, elite healthcare. Um, it's something that I I don't think anyone takes for granted in here because you know it's uh, it's paint yourself up when you're getting treated by some of the best in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, it's great to see um, the results. I suppose come out the other end mm-hmm. from, from from your perspective. But um, just to just to talk a bit about Trinity, um, as you may or may not know, Trinity was founded over 150 years ago, and uh, over 150 Trinity students have played for Ireland. You know, um, I, I know you guys are just you just don't have the uh, the time to 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 play for your club. But as you've both said, I think you both you both support your clubs uh in whenever you can um you know how important is it to to be a representative of trinity and and, and be on campus and uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about your academics in a moment but how important is that from from your perspective uh, ryan um yeah as i said I, I love um being in trinity um it's quite a unique college in terms of how it's smack bang in the middle of a city you yeah. know there's some beautiful grass in there that we can uh, we can we're fortunate enough to play on Sacred um, grass, college park. Yeah, sacred, sacred grass yeah, um, yeah. that I hope never leaves. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I always had, my dad would have gone to Trinity, my granddad went to Trinity, my uncle went to Trinity. I have, I have such a connection to that college. Um, yeah. And it felt like there was only one college that I'd be going to when I, when I considered where I was going to go. Uh, I, I guess just from the history that's associated with and the fact yeah. that my, you know, my family's been there and it was a kind of a, a rite of passage to go there and you know what i love so much yeah. about trinity is the diversity and people you meet um yeah you know, so many people coming from various parts of the country and the world and um it's very inclusive in in in, in whoever you are to come and, and study in trinity and i've yeah. definitely met so many people through my course who i uh, i can guarantee you i wouldn't have met if i wasn't in trinity so um yeah sure. i guess that's one of the biggest um benefits that i've found from trinity Absolutely, uh, and Joe, just to pick up on that diversity point, uh, I know it's it's very close to your heart. I know your brother Andrew is an ambassador for for Leinster rugby, which is fantastic. Yeah. You know, you know how important is diversity for you and 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 uh, and that connection, a family connection. Yeah, obviously it's massive. Um, got my brother who's um who's got Down syndrome, so a very very close relationship with him. He's um no, it's very cool. He's been called the culture captain in Leinster this season, so he's um great he's, stuff. Uh, Play a good role, but yeah, no, I've started um did a bit of work there with dancing dance in your center. I just kind of promoted the World Dance Syndrome Day. I kind of got a photo shoot too with me and my brother and things like that. Just kind of promote initiatives like that. Just kind of Fantastic. awareness of of uh, people with dance syndrome. But um talked about it before. Like I know that like getting them involved in things like sports, people with disabilities, you just they just get so much joy out of it. And I've talked about it before in the past that like it's crazy how how capable I think so people don't really realize how people with a disability can be like it doesn't limit them because like I know my brother Andrew he's usually actually a bit shy when you meet him initially but like once you spend a bit of time with him get him to learn a new skill he just he excels like crazy so it's great um, yeah yeah so I've yeah. I've I've had some great times in I've even I, I just enjoyed as well like they're like people with disability dancing your people they're they're, oh, they're some of the happiest people you ever meet so that's great um yeah. I went like I even went down recently a couple of weeks ago. I went down to to their basketball training and like they do like a they play down on like, Tuesday nights and I went down just to pick them up. But I just went in joined in on their basketball game like and uh, and I was yeah. playing against them. You'd be actually be surprised. The lads are just like like I was getting done badly by the guys. Like I could barely <laughs> keep up with them. Like cause they they play every night, so they're like proper like intense yeah. about it. But they're class like so and they're they're great crack so. Uh... Well done. I think it's, 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 it's yeah. No, it's good that I get able to use my platform a bit. Like some people get to see a bit of Andrew, a bit of his personality, and it's it's great because now he he's kind of been out there a bit more. Like so, people kind of a bit more things to talk about him when they meet him. So no, it's, Abs- um, absolutely. Perfect. And and look, just on that, I know you gave your man of, man of the match award to Andrew. Uh, I I know you did it really to promote 
you know the capabilities i suppose of people with down syndrome which is fantastic you know and i think uh you know you guys like it or not are influencers on social media so it was that that particular photograph i think of yourself and andrew and, and, and your family went went very viral i think and, and 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 that's that's only good news i feel for for diversity in general yeah yeah no i didn't i didn't think much of the time i just added yeah. my medal probably probably better off that i didn't like lose it or something but uh I, I uh they gave him people people really liked it. They um it was a nice moment to share and um I think yeah, people brought a bit of joy just seeing Andrew there out enjoying himself. So Yeah. Um yeah. yeah, no, it is it is good. So if I can use like maybe my platform a bit to promote that or maybe promote promote a bit more inclusion sport with uh disability, I so I just I think it's great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um Ryan, I know you're we had to tear you away from the books. I think earlier on you were um, engrossed in in in, in uh, following up on your academic piece. I think you're both doing challenging undergraduate degrees, um, and I understand you had to complete your capstone during during maybe during Rugby World Cup or during Six Nations. You know, um, you know it can't be easy to balance the professional athlete with the with with the degree. I'm sure Trinity and, and the RFU are are helpful in that respect. But you know, how do you meet that challenge, or is it actually a welcome diversion to have uh, some academics uh, to to go with the uh, all the training and uh, and the application in that respect? Yeah, I guess I guess what I've learned um, trying to do um, to basically two two jobs nearly, or like yeah. trying to. Trying to excel at two things um, is the ability to have um, a large capacity um, for work, um, and how I believe from, from the environments I've been exposed to and the people I've been exposed to, structure is incredibly important. Um, so, you know, planning your day, planning your week, understanding what you want to get out of it um, is very important for me. You know, I, I like to sit down on Sundays and and plan. Okay, how am I going to achieve X, Y, and Z this week? Um, because then I believe once you actually have it down on paper and you're looking back on it, you're holding yourself um, accountable to it. Um, yeah. And for me, for, for me, that's very important. You know, I just, for example, um, I think it's Paul um, Donovan has just uh, got uh, graduate of the year for his oh, medicine degree. The, the, the rower. The rower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he's also an Olymp- Olympian. So, you know, like it's incredible that you can what you can achieve when you have the capacity to 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 do it and, yeah and absolutely discipline so um, and yeah. it comes down to that discipline as well and, and he's probably a prime example of it but for me that's what it will be it's the capacity to to, to do that workflow which comes from structure and discipline yeah and, and how important ryan is that you know the fact that you guys aren't faced with enormous travel schedules you know i know you you, you travel a fair bit at weekends but it's never it's never long distance, um, you know, in comparison to maybe to your Southern Hemisphere uh, mm-hmm. fellow players, you know, who travel from South Africa to New Zealand, Australia and Argentina, you know, um, is, is that a big factor that that travel challenge uh, that that European players don't face as much as, uh, as the Southern Hemisphere? Um, obviously, I'm my my answer is biased and ignorant because i haven't done um what those lads have had to do but for example i was coming home from london on the weekend there um and i'm always on the train i was in the airport i was on the plane and you know for me they were great opportunities to get work done so i believe it's i think i believe it's a from my view it's a mindset thing it's if you want to get the work done you'll get the work done you'll find the time um you know there's so many times where if you bring your notebook you'll have 10 15 minutes to to write down something so um, I haven't experienced what those lads have experienced, but I believe um, from my mild yeah. experience, it's just it's a mindset. Yeah, yeah. And Joe, what about yourself? How how do you cope with the the, the dual challenge? Yeah, no, obviously it has challenges at some point, but um, definitely like there's definitely sometimes during like if you're playing a big game week, I'd find it kind of tough to switch off and that, and maybe dip into some college. But uh, no, it can definitely be a great distraction. I think. Um, me and Ryan have been working together on a project. I think it's it can be quite good to kind of get your brain working and kind of gives you a bit of rest from rugby, like when you're taken out of it. Like because you're kind of all rugby the whole time, your nervous system feels very tense. I find, but it's kind of switching to the academics, like works a different side of your brain, and you kind yeah. of feel like you're growing in that sense. I think it's um, those some of the final year projects that me and Ryan have been doing. They've been probably a bit more, uh. They've actually probably been a bit more enjoyable than sort of just maybe studying for an exam or out learning something. Like we've had to 
kind of come and put in action plans and then we were we were doing things like we we managed to kind of marry our our rugby and our our kind of college together because we get kind of create an action plan to like create like change around plastic so we right. were trying to reduce the plastic and in, in plastic water bottle use in um in leinster so we Very did good. a thing we had to we had to go into leinster's and uh yeah. presented to the, to our whole squad and staff and um, it can be pretty tough now in fairness yeah. to try and convince some rugby yeah. players to change their habits especially they're quite stubborn but yeah um, no yeah. we did things like that but uh, um, did, you, did you get a fair hearing from the boys? Yeah. Yeah, we got a fair hearing. Try to make it as enjoyable or like hard as possible, but they're a very tough crowd to impress. So, uh, okay, no, yeah, oh, I got handed a bit. But I think, um, well as Ryan said, if you find the time, I feel like so sort of the busier you are, the more you get done, which is kind yeah. of, I think it, it kind That's of true. is like you have to be quite, quite um, on it on your planning. I'd be the same as Ryan, it's kind of drilled into us. Yeah. And my weeks quite, quite meticulously. So, um, if you kind oh. of, plan it and plan it right and usually find a way to do it but it can definitely be tough at times and I definitely well, still struggle with it sure well done though and uh, it's a great message I think to send out from from the webinar that you're uh, that you're, you're your message is basically um manage your time as, as efficiently as you can and yeah. uh, it, it's amazing what you can achieve very good um I know both of you have other sporting interests you know um Ryan I believe you're pretty keen on golf is that fair to say and uh played a bit in port rush and ross and penna do you want to do you want to tell us your yeah, score like, yeah, maybe not maybe not but do you want to road to scratch <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's been on pause now for a while unfortunately oh, and that, the lights coming back the clocks are turning yeah so uh i'll be uh once uh once yeah. summer summer break comes i'll be i'll be on the golf course um but, as uh, much as i'm on the rugby pitch yeah and how did you find those courses up north good uh, incredible, yeah. Incredible. I, um, I believe Ross Pena is uh, spectacular. Yeah, it is. And for me, it's just been out in nature. Um, it's just it's incredible. It uh, gives you great perspective on 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 life yeah. and how you know, yeah. you know, you don't have to you don't have to complicate things. You know, simple exactly. things are are often best. So for me, you know, going fishing or playing golf or going for a walk with my dog gives me a great time to just reflect and um, and realize how grateful I am. So yeah, great, yeah. And uh, uh, Joe, I believe you're an NFL enthusiast. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be a bit strong. I've kind of gone yeah. to the NFL a bit recently. I'd, I'd like to, I know Ryan, Ryan being his his voice of that as well. But uh, no, I yeah. um, do I do I do kind of like watching some of the NFL players. Like they're those kind of cool. How like even how the NFL kind of markets itself. It's such a big brand worldwide. It's kind of cool yeah. to see how yeah it's such high brand of sport. Like you'd love to see rugby maybe like. Get, yeah. get to a point where it won't, won't be happening in the near future but like see with the numbers in America but um, it'd be cool to see it grow like that but no I definitely think yeah. I always find it enjoyable yeah. to kind of like take bits from other sports because like they just do things differently and I think you can learn a lot from it so yeah. even like, I, just, I like watching clips of some of their athletes or what they do yeah. and then yeah stuff like but that so. just maybe getting back to, to, to the business end you know I, I, I now work with an organization called Interpath and uh, we'd spent a fair bit of time you know assessing sports businesses and, and you're right NFL is, is the ultimate sports franchise and it's yeah. it's it's getting more and more successful I think the principal reason being that it's so competitive um, that I think every year every franchise has a decent chance of winning and you've seen some extraordinary reversals of people or teams finishing last and then and then winning Super Bowl or getting into the Super Bowl you know so it's it's amazingly successful rugby's got a long way to go but but hopefully um the, the revenues from rugby world cup maybe to to be simplistic about it can can help you know achieve more more equality i thought it was fantastic by the way for italy's performance in the six nations this year uh to bounce yes. you know bounce back from from not a great world cup and uh you know a fair bit of investment is going in there but it was good to see and i'm sure you guys would agree with that yeah the more um definitely the more competitive you get any competition the more eyes you get on it, it grows the game so once you have top teams competing against each other, like that's what people want to see. So you don't want to have one team that just dominates the league. Even though fans kind of do like that when there's a team that kind of oh, um does dominate, but no, the more teams you have, more competition, more more countries involved is definitely for the better. Yeah, yeah. Guys, uh, I'm conscious that uh, we've uh, gone on for about 40 minutes. It's been really really interesting from my perspective and uh, we could probably talk for a long time but there are a lot of questions in the in the Q&A which I'm just going to touch on uh, first one is for you Ryan um, 
It's a, a clinical psychologist, uh, Trinity graduate from 2014, who loves your statement that you have to suffer to create resilience. Um, and uh, they, uh, this graduate would like your permission uh, to use that uh, in their, in their, I think, in their, in their life going forward. Is that uh, something you want to comment on? Yeah, um, I yeah, go for it. But I have to give credit to I saw a um, quote from um, the CEO of um, Nivitar, the, the new uh, uh, semiconductor N company. N N N N NVIDIA. NVIDIA. Yeah. NVIDIA, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Their yeah. CEO was talking about that. My friend yeah. showed it to me there the other day, and uh, I thought it was an incredibly um, rather, or pertinent point. So uh, I'm taking no credit for that quote, but you may, uh, you may use it. Very good. Um, one for you, Joe, uh, from Amy. Um, can you ask Joe and Ryan, actually, how they cope with the pressure of playing in a packed stadium? Um, yeah, I was. I, it's kind of weird, like, when you're when you're so into a game, sometimes it kind of, like, the crowd also kind of blocks out, so you don't really hear them as much. But I think, especially when you start to feel the pressure, I think if you've no kind of, like, repetition of what you do, because we train and, like, do mental mental reps during the week of kind of thinking how I'm gonna like ex save I'm executing a line out it's like last play we need to score. I've done so many reps and training and repetition and I've done during the week I've done a few mental reps and maybe even thinking of what it feels like even coming up to the game like what if I was in this situation where it's a minute left, the crowd's on top of you, how you're gonna feel and kind of prepare for that moment before I think makes a big difference. So then you kinda of, can just go and go oh, Prepared well, and then you trust what you, you've done, and then you know just execute what you've repeatedly done. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it it can be tough, but um, I do find then when you once you trust your preparation, and then yeah, once you're so zoned in a game, you kind of the crowd kind of is irrelevant almost. Yeah, yeah. Did it get easier, Joe, after playing the South African match in the pool phase, and then into the into the knockouts? W was it somewhat easier to to go out there having experienced it already? Uh, yeah, the World Cup crowds is definitely step up to anything I'd seen ever before. So yeah, um, it is something that's still like you still feel real privileged, and it still takes you back every time. You, like you go to the Stade de France or those big stadiums, section France, like it's it's actually a zoo in there almost. So like you you uh, it does take you back, but you definitely get a bit more comfortable in that environment. Sure, and uh, one for you, Ryan, if you don't mind, uh, from Pedro. Uh... And uh, first of all, you are great ambassadors of Trinity College and, and Trinity Rugby. But, um, and this is probably relevant given rugby is a 32 county sport in, in, in this, uh, on this island. Uh, but the question is, should Trinity College create a special pathway for students from Northern Ireland to attend and play sports in Trinity? Um, geez, that really that's probably, me that's yeah. probably a trick. That's probably a tricky one. Maybe the answer is yes. <laughs> Yeah, as as you said, you know, it's, it shouldn't be tied down to Orange ever. You know, Trinity should be a place anyone can come, and and there should be opportunity for everyone there. As I said before, it's an incredibly inclusive college, so I feel if you knock on the door, there should be uh, someone opening and welcoming you in. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That's that's a very fair comment. Um. Joe. Uh. One for you, and uh, you've probably been asked this many times, but. Uh, who is who has been your toughest opponent to play against uh, thus far, and uh, and maybe I have a separate one for for Ryan along those lines. So over to you, Joe. In terms of toughest, you reckon like a team or kind of player or like I I, I think you'd answer it in both in both because I, I think if I may say so in rugby, it's all about the team, isn't it? And individual yeah, yeah. matchups are important, but really it's about how tough the team was. If 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 the opposition don't have 15 players up to the requisite standards it's uh, it's probably easier to play against them that's all from yeah but no, yeah, it's definitely um definitely team sport no one player can really uh yeah. very crazy yeah i um i remember thinking because like, i think those like new zealand teams are always very tough because i remember even going like obviously because the all blacks are incredibly tough to play and like even i remember a couple of years ago i was a lot a bit younger when we played down new zealand only played the Maori games yeah against the all blacks and i always just find that those New Zealand teams, they're just they're so well drilled and they've got they've got speed, kind of skill, power, and kind of attack you in like a lot of different ways. So I think those kind of teams are usually the hardest to play against. So I'd say kind of that's that's probably what I'd say because they've got they can kind of do it all. So it's just very tough to kind of contain them. Okay, 
fair, fair comment. Um, and a nice message here from Claude and Joe, uh, wishing you a pleasant birthday yesterday, apparently. There you go. Yeah. Well, Thanks very much, Claude. There you go. Um, Thanks. Very nice of you. And uh, yeah, a interesting question here that uh, maybe we can all answer. But uh, we've talked a lot about the business of Irish rugby. We have understandably focused on on the on the male component part of that. But the question is, what what can be done to grow women's rugby in Ireland in the next few years? I, I would certainly say that the Irish Rugby Union have acknowledged weakness in that space over the last number of years, and are 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 making significant investment to to change that. And I think the the coverage and I think the actual staging of the Six Nations after the men's Six Nations, I think that's a positive. And, you know, we saw, I think, good audiences last weekend and hopefully a big audience for the Ireland-Italy game this weekend. But over to you guys, what what, what do you feel about that? Yeah. Um, Maybe Ryan, yeah. Yeah, so just going back to what I said previously about when we asked about the structure of, of men's rugby and I, and I said how... You know, there's quite a clear pathway to go from an underage to a professional senior. You know, I think that's probably where the the investment is is would be most beneficial, and I'm sure that's already taking place. Um, because you know, as a as a young kid or as a as a young girl, you know, the sport's not as big as the male sport. So you wanna you wanna you wanna feel that pathway is there, and you know, mentors and past players and showing the way because. Um, it's you know it's a lot harder to go through an uncharted territory, but if it's there and it's mapped out, it gives you um, much more chance of getting getting success. I think so. I think that's where probably it is really. Yeah, um, and uh, I think just a couple more. Uh, one for me actually. Uh, a question: Do I think Black Rock committed daylight robbery to beat Bevedere last weekend in, in an AIL match? I would absolutely agree. Uh, Black Rock scored at the very very last play in the game and uh, probably an undeserved victory but Joe might might back me up here I think they've that team have pulled off some pretty bizarre uh, wins over the last couple of years and uh, this was just just another one uh, but it was very well deserved win I think fair play to them yeah very, uh... but uh, just as a, as a wider comment on that and uh, I touched on it earlier um, it's a very enjoyable experience going to watch club rugby yeah, uh, no, whether whether your team wins or loses you know uh, there was a a full lunch beforehand and uh, very, very enjoyable uh, right through the game. Uh, very competitive. Uh, standards, obviously, not at the level that the gents I'm talking to, but still, that doesn't take away from the enjoyment factor. And I think that that community spirit, you know, you see it in Clontarf and Terenure and at, at Cork Con and everywhere else. I think it's uh, it's it's really encouraging for the sport of rugby to have to have that that flourishing. And uh, I know the clubs are challenged financially, and uh, they. They do. They do an amazing job, I think, to stay to stay alive. But it's a it's it's a very enjoyable, and I encourage people to to go and watch your local club whenever you can. Um, guys, um, uh, one for one for you, if that's okay, Ryan. Um, who was your role model? Who would your role model be growing up? I think you touched on it actually in terms of uh, being at home and, and watching maybe the Six Nations and other sports. But did you have any role models that that you know led you into the sport of rugby? Um, probably none that led me into the sport of rugby. Um, but I loved um, we loved tennis as a family growing up, so I would have watched a lot of tennis. Um, I remember what you know, getting up early and watching Nadal or Federer play early morning in the Aussie Open um, in January. And then as I got older, I would have got into some American sports, so I loved watching the NFL and Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers would have been two guys who I would have uh, would have watched um, playing, and I would have watched a lot of interviews and. You know, listen to all the podcasts there on, and I got some great, uh, some great tips. And one particular book, um, the the Four Agreements, um, you know, talked about kind of just a a simple, simple way of living life in a more holistic way. So uh, I, sure. I would have taken a lot from those players. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Joe, can I ask you that question as well? Um, were there any particular individuals who inspired you into into rugby or into sport, or did you just enjoy the enjoy the game? Yeah, I I don't have like any like yeah. one person that I was really looking up to that that crazy. Like I remember like, when I was younger, especially like Brian Driscoll, you like do things that other players couldn't. You know, I'm trying to replicate that when you're playing tip rugby with your friends. Um, you know, I I remember I I kind of. I was kind of like learn more about him a few years ago, like Brad Thorne, who's at Leinster, won the World Cup with New Zealand. 
Um, I just I liked his attitude towards training and gym and kind of kind of relatable. So I, I really liked him. And then mm-hmm. used to uh, I used to swim a lot before school when, when I was when I was younger. So like I'd get up in the morning before school and do a bit of swimming. I I think yeah. that, that was great for me anyway, building a bit of discipline and things like that. But I thought uh, I always thought Michael Phelps, yeah, um, just the success he had and how how dedicated he was to his craft. Um, yeah. always found him expire in, like inspiring enough. So. And yeah. um, they'd be probably a few guys I, I kind of like. Yeah, yeah. You seem to be inspired by people who are prepared to work hard at their sport. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I suppose, yeah. I suppose that's kind of one of the key ingredients, I suppose. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of other questions, but last one for, for you, Ryan, uh, before we need to wrap this up, but very tricky one. What's your favourite fish to catch? <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, whatever hits the line. Whatever, like. whatever you can get. Yeah. Whatever yeah. hits the line. Um, Bro, I, I, there's one from uh, Ali Begley I think Ryan is about how do you deal with all the ladies attention in Trinity it does for you <laughs> <laughs> oh I don't know about that Maybe that's for a different day yeah, yeah. that's for him to answer yeah feel, feel free we have a minute or two if you want to open up for that uh, uh, yeah, save that one no I'm, I, yeah you guys have, have, have seen the questions and you've seen I mean I've read out the questions but there have been a lot of uh, compliments for, uh, piling in I think in terms of both for your, your your generous time today, but also for your your achievements and uh... there's a there's one there's one question I'd like to look at and um, it's from Ronan Clark. It's, uh, with all the talk of changing rules to crack down on things like scrum resets and kick tennis, are we in danger of over overemphasizing rugby as an entertainment industry and losing sight of the true spirit of the game? Yeah. Quite an interesting one because there has been chat around um, the environment around or the atmosphere in the Aviva Stadium and, and other stadiums um, previously. Yeah. And I think now t- with people, there's so much um, options and choices of what sport or if it's yeah. what gaming or whatever they get into. So I think, you know, yeah. while we never want to lose the true spirit of the game and um, no one would like to do that, there has to be an evolution of um, the whole pre post and um, kind of atmosphere around it. So you, you, the Americans do do it incredibly well. You know, they tailgate before games, um, to let yeah. some live music or DJs before the game, during half time. You know, I, I think while we'll keep the game at uh, the game, we won't change that. I think there definitely has to be an improvement yeah. for how we bring new audiences to the game because, you know, Joe was mentioning about the NFL and how they do it so well. Um, yeah it's so important that we do that because if we want to grow the game and, you know, the values that are associated with rugby, you know, yes. they can only be Im- Im- imparted on people who are actually aware of the game and who are, who are spectators or participants, mainly participants. So we have to bring people in, not just through rugby, but through other avenues. And then once they're in there, they'll start to realize, you know, what rugby can give you. So um, yeah. I think it's a very yeah. interesting question that I'd like to answer. No, and I, uh... Well done for picking up on that. Look, I think it's an absolute truism that particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, they're very challenged. It's so competitive, particularly in Australia. You're probably aware that rugby union is probably fourth or fifth sport down there. And therefore, you're competing in the entertainment industry, both in sport, but also music and drama uh, for for people's uh, dollars to to invest in watching a sport, but also uh, for sponsorship and, and everything that and broadcasting fees as well. So they, they would be pushing hard on the entertainment value. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges uh, research would show is that, uh, sorry, going on here, but it's a topic that we, I was close to, uh, that people new to the game find it difficult to understand the game. And, and that's one of the things NFL does really well. It's very clear, I think, how you how you win a game of NFL. And uh, even the decision making is very, very quick as well. And uh, look, it's something where rugby has wrestled with for a long time. But it's uh, it, it re- recently issued a, a statement saying that they want to reimagine the game from an entertainment perspective. And uh, that's what that's all about. Yeah, you know, I couldn't yeah. agree more. I hope, hope to see that coming to fruition. We're, we're, yeah, I don't know if you'd agree, Joe, but you're probably, we're probably fortunate in this part of the world that there is a a very strong audience in Europe for for rugby union. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean it won't become more competitive as things go forward. Yeah, no, I think rugby's in a good place and definitely trying to. It is quite a complicated game to someone just going into it. Like, um, obviously, people see the big hits and different things. Up, like there's like a lot of kind of nuances and, and small laws. It's very hard if you haven't played the game, especially to stand it. But um. I think I think rugby's kind of in a good place and great to see it grow because yeah, as Ryan said as well, like the values that it 
got rugby has, we got a sportsmanship, uh, just team, team, team effort and things like that. So, um, yeah, oh, I'd, I'd be great. It's great the way it's got. I think, and if I may say so, the values of rugby are what distinguish it. You know, there's a concept in marketing of unique selling points, and and rugby's unique selling point is probably is probably the values and the uh, respect for the referee, the respect for your opponent and uh, I think it's really important that those values are, are maintained both from a, a sporting perspective but also from a commercial perspective so anyway 100%. Uh, yeah. yeah, guys um, thanks on this, Ryan, is there any other questions that you wanted to answer? Well, let's, have a, let's have a look yeah. here we? yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I know time is against us but uh, we've time, we've time yeah um, you're on a roll. Yeah. Um, so, a good question here from Jared White. Um, the Irish team has such a good winning record over the last two years. How does the team manage to back up such colossal performances on a regular basis? Is it fitness, good coaching? Um, a lot has been spoken about the mental skills training. Can any of those elements be replicated in the business world? Um, for me, and then I'll pass it on to Joe, um, consistency. Um, in your practice um, is so important. Um, having a plan um, that you having a plan that you uh, that you that you set out. So whatever the goal or the objective is, but it's working back to that, and it's the consistent, consistent, purposeful practice. Um, like if I were to to just go away and focus on um, one kind of general um, kind of. Uh, my, uh, ca caption line or whatever is it would be to work hard per be purposeful practice consistently done and um, that's all we do um day in day out in in, in ireland and leinster um, and then there's much more that works underneath that joe what do you think yeah i think um because it can be quite a hard thing because especially the way in sports people have quite short memories like no one really cares like say if you played four games in a row you've been sore you might like things of like that, what's going on outside of rugby? You're, you with sport. You're kind of the suppression you to perform every time you take the pitch. So mm -hmm. something you kind of have to get used to. And I know that's been drilled into us. I know because like sure Lancaster, uh, you'd always talk about consistency of performance. Like no matter who you're playing, if it's like if it's a World Cup final or you're playing the preseason game, you prepare the same every week. You don't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. So I I couldn't like to, I think just going to the business world. Like I can't see how that's. How that's um that couldn't be helpful because I just I kind of love the quote about like how you absolutely mess, mess up but it's like uh, how you do anything is how you do everything so like I think if you've got to present yourself in a certain professional way in the business world like every meeting you're coming to you're prepared you know what they're talking about I think that's just kind of paramount yeah, yeah. if you want to be successful anywhere so you're 100% um, right and uh, you know the training you guys are having will, will stand to you in, in, in life and you've seen so many inspirational business people start their start their careers in at a high level in, in sport um, and uh, that just reflects your comments you know Joe are you going to answer Donica Carroll who inspired the mullet who inspired, uh, who inspired the mullet um, I kind of just went like I say the mullet's been pretty done a lot these days yeah uh, but I kind of just went one day I was like I'll change it up a bit and a few months ago and I've kind of kept it rolling because it's probably getting a bit out of hand um, but yeah I just kind of Decided to go with it. I didn't take it when I was for inspiration. Maybe yeah, Donica, you get a get a mullet going yourself. <laughs> you. Very good, guys. We do have to wrap it up. I'm afraid. Um, look, on behalf of Trinity alumni, many thanks for your time. Um, and I see lots of uh, thank yous. And I see Emma has uh, thank you for use of that quote, Ryan. So, um, she's obviously stayed stayed with the with the webinar. So, thanks again. Um. Hopefully that's been interesting for people listening in. Um, we should do it again. We could do another hour, I'd say, no problem. But uh, I will now hand back to Brian Bennett of TCD Alumni. And uh, Brian will uh, make some closing remarks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for that um, really informative talk, especially to Joe, to Ryan and Robert. Thank you so much. We're delighted that you, Joe and Ryan, could be with us today. And thank you, Robert, as well, for being so generous with your time and expertise. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the alumni office for making today's webinar possible. And of course, thanks to all our fantastic audience for joining us today and asking questions. One of the great things about these webinars is the ability to engage with each other and ask questions. So it's brilliant to see that enthusiasm. So thank you. I'm going to share my screen now about our next webinar. We hope you'll join us again. 
Uh, next month, as Inspiring Ideas at Trinity welcomes Peter McFeely, Global Head of Communications and Strategic Planning for Food at the World Wild of the World Wildlife Federation, who will be in conversation with Jane Stout, Vice President for Biodiversity and Climate Action, Trinity College Dublin. In our webinar, Eating to Save the World, How What You Eat Affects Global Stability. Details on how to register for the next webinar will be sent via email and posted to social media in the coming weeks. If you have any questions or comments regarding this webinar series or any other questions you'd like to ask us here in the alumni office, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next month.